Okay. So this is the pre-lab for the physical and chemical changes lab. Uh, this lab is, well, when students perform it, it tends to be one of the more enjoyable labs for them. Um, there's a lot of activity. There's some pops and fizzes and some flames. And so uh, it, it's kind of exciting for students. Uh, but it's also a very challenging lab for most students. And um, I, I think you'll probably understand why a little bit later. So unfortunately, the way things are set up this semester, you guys get to miss out on all the excitement and get to do all the challenge. Uh, sorry about that. That's just the way things are this semester. Hopefully fall is a little bit better. This, what I have right here, is the department handout. And you have this available on the module. I suggest you download it and read it pretty thoroughly. Um, it talks about pattern types, or I, I mean, I'm sorry, reaction types. I tend to think of them as reaction patterns than types. Uh, and it talks about decomposition reactions and single displacement reactions, and double displacement reactions. Okay, and decomposition reactions, acid-base neutralizations. Okay. So again, decomposition, single displacement reactions, and showing the pattern right here. You have combination reactions, shows the pattern, just A and B coming together to form AB. And it gives you an example, a real life example. Uh, decomposition reactions. It shows you the pattern, so it's just the reverse of this one, decomposition. AB falling apart to A plus B, and it gives you a real life example. Single displacement reactions, right? where A reacts with BC, and A basically displaces B to form AC, and it gives you a real life example, so forth and so on. Okay. So you need to read this. Now, I'm going to do some reactions for you, and you're going to observe these reactions. And we're going to do our notebook a little bit different this time than what we've been doing. Uh, what you will do for each test, I'm going to run five tests. And what you'll do for each test on your notebook is at the very top, you will identify it as the test number. Test number. Like so and you'll give the number here. Below that, you'll give the chemical equation. Right? So chemical equation right here. Chemical equation has a little arrow and it has products on one side. I'm sorry, duh. Get it. Pass backwards. Reactants on one side and products. So you'll give me the complete, correct chemical reaction, and it should be balanced, all right? Stoichiometrically balanced. Uh, I am assuming that you guys are doing this in lecture by the time you come to this lab. All right, so you understand some stoichiometry, you know how to balance reactions. Okay. Below this, you will give me the reaction type, okay? So a reaction type. A reaction pattern. So below this, you're going to tell me whether it's a uh, uh, double displacement reaction or decomposition reaction, so forth and so on. Below this, you will give me your observations and reasons. Okay. You'll explain your observations and reasons below this that you're making to both come up with this reaction, this equation, and to identify the reaction type. So each test should have this information in it. Again, you'll have the test number, you'll have the chemical equation, you'll have the reaction type or pattern down below that, just give me a name, All right? Double displacement reaction, single displacement, single displacement reaction. And below this, you're going to make observations and reasons, right? You're going to give me your observations and reasons for 
coming to these conclusions, both for the chemical equation and the reaction type. So you'll observe the reaction based on those observations and knowledge of the reaction types that we're going to go over here in, in a second. Uh, well, actually, I've gone over them already. I'm not going to go over reaction types anymore. You need to read that information. But based on the observations and your understanding of reaction types, you're going to come up with both the reactants. That's simple because I'm getting that to you. But you're going to have to identify the products. You'll have to identify the products based on your observations and your understanding of the different reaction types. And that's what's kind of challenging. right? You'll have the reactants. I'll give these to you during the experiment. You'll know what's reacting although it's probably a good idea if you understand your nomenclature. For example, if I say calcium carbonate, you should be able to understand that calcium carbonate is CaCO3. Okay? You should know that. And if you don't, well, then you're going to have to use the internet to look it up. Uh, normally, we do a nomenclature, nomenclature lab in here. It's a dry lab, and you do a worksheet. And I give a lecture on nomenclature, but the semester is not designed um, that way. So I'm not giving any nomenclature lectures, and I'm not giving any nomenclature tests or exams. But going forward, it's my understanding that you're supposed to understand your nomenclature, so get that down. But anyway, I'm going to give you the reactants over here during the experiment. I'll tell you what I'm mixing together. You're going to make observations. Based on those observations and your understanding of reaction types, you're going to identify what the products are and you're going to give me the products. And you're going to give those observations and those reasons you're making the identification down below this. So that's how your notebook is going to be done on this particular experiment. Okay? All right. Before we go further, I want to talk to you about chemical equations. Chemical equations. We can use chemical equations for, well, reactions, and also we can use them in explaining phase changes, phase changes. Uh, and I'm going to explain how we identify phase changes in chemical equations. And we'll start with a very common substance we're all familiar with, H2O, dihydrogen monoxide, H2O. And we know the solid form of H2O. Okay. So I write an S here. I'm telling you that this H2O is a solid. Right. So the parentheses and S represents telling you that this is a solid, which we call ice commonly. And we know that ice can melt in H2O, it can turn into a liquid. And that's how we illustrate that this H2O is now a liquid. This process is telling us, this chemical, chemical equation is telling you that water or ice is going through a phase change to form water. We also know that water can boil and turn into steam. And steam is a gas. So this is water vapor over here. So G represents gas. This is telling you that H2O over here is in the gas phase. Liquid phase, solid phase. So that's how we identify phases in our chemical equations. And this experiment, when you write your equations, you need to tell me what phase you're talking about when you're identifying a substance. What phase is it in? There's another phase that you're going to need to know about. Let's say that we have some sodium chloride, table salt, and it's a solid. And sodium chloride, we're going to mix it with water here. All right. So this is telling you, you won't see this in your experiments, but this is telling you that I'm taking sodium chloride and I'm dissolving it in water. On the other side over here, I have sodium chloride. 
in the aqueous phase, AQ. AQ. Okay. Sodium chloride is in the aqueous phase. It's dissolved in water. That's what this AQ means. Sodium chloride dissolved in water, AQ. Okay. Aqueous. Aqueous. That's what AQ means. Here it's a solid. Table salt. Stuff you see on your table. Add it to water and it becomes sodium chloride dissolved in water. It's in the aqueous phase. There are a lot of things that are in the aqueous phase. We can dissolve them into water. So these are the four phases that you need to be aware of and how we indicate those phases. Okay. Now, there's something out of, else about this phase right here. We can represent this phase a little bit differently. Um, when sodium chloride dissolves, so I have a sodium atom over here. This is sodium. And it's a cation, right? And we have a chloride ion over here. And of course, these are only two of them. There's a lattice that forms, right? We have sodium and chloride all bunched together, and it forms a lattice. It goes out. As far as the atoms are concerned, that looks like infinity. But I'm going to represent just a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And that can actually exist. All right. But if it's dissolved in water, water, due to its characteristics of being a polar substance, can actually separate these ions. So water, I'm drawing a water molecule like this. Right. Last experiment is our water molecule. We know that it's bent. It's a bent geometry. And this oxygen and this hydrogen form a bond that's a polar bond. There's a partial positive charge on this hydrogen and a partial negative charge Put it on the wrong side. All right, so a partial positive charge on this hydrogen and a partial negative charge on this oxygen, okay? And there's a partial positive charge on this hydrogen. And again, this is a partial negative on this oxygen. These little things here are deltas, small deltas. And I mean, this indicates that there's a partial positive charge on the hydrogens and a partial negative on the oxygen. And that arises due to the electronegativity difference between those two atoms, right? So the electrons that are in this bond, right, they're pulled more toward, they're being shared, but they're pulled more toward oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative. And since they're being pour, pulled more toward oxygen, oxygen has a partial negative charge. This negative charge can interact with the positive charge on sodium. And so it lines up kind of like this. So you have another water molecule that lines up like so, another one that lines up like so, maybe. On the chloride side, it's the reverse. It's the partial positive that lines up with the chloride. Okay. So eventually, you get more water molecules that come in, and it shields. These water molecules begin to shield the positive charge on the sodium and the chloride, the negative charge on the chloride. Right? So these water molecules can basically pull apart the sodium and chloride ion. And so over a time, over a period of time, you get a situation where you have a sodium atom, sodium ion, and a chloride ion that have been separated. You have water lined up like so around the sodium. And around the chloride, you have the reverse. Okay. 
like so. And so this is how sodium chloride dissolves into water. Right? Water gets in there and separates the ions. And the ions basically float off into the water separate from each other. This situation here is what is represented by this, okay? sodium chloride in the aqueous phase. So we can also represent this, sodium chloride in the aqueous phase, in the following manner. Basically, this, these two things are the same thing. We have sodium ion, right? It's plus sodium ion that's in the aqueous phase, plus chloride ion in the aqueous phase. So this representation and this representation down here are the same. Okay? They're just written differently. This is a more condensed version. This is a version that represents reality, I suppose, a little bit better. Okay? But these are, are basically the same. When we talk about ionic equations, ionic equations are written in this form. Okay? Molecular equations are written in this form. And we're about to talk about that going forward. By the way, this situation down here, it doesn't really look like this. This is static. Uh, what's happening is water molecules are coming in and leaving. And as a water molecule leaves, another one takes its place. It's a very dynamic process. And it's happening very, very quickly, right? uh, unimaginably quickly. Uh, same things happen over here. Water leaves, a water molecule leaves, another one comes in to take its place, so forth and so on. Okay? But these sodium and chloride ions are floating around in the water separate from each other. And that's what this means, sodium chloride aqueous phase. And that's also why we can write it like this. Okay. Now let's talk about, well, let's talk about an equation. I'm going to talk about a reaction. I'll give you one example, maybe a couple of them. And we're going to talk about different ways that we can write chemical equations. So here's one example. A reaction. So let's say that we have hmm, zinc metal. Now let's talk about iron. Iron. Iron metal. Iron's a metal and it's in the solid phase. And it's going to react with a solution, an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. So it's an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is an ionic substance. It is dissolved in the aqueous phase. The copper ion and the sulfate ion are separated, much like this example over here in the aqueous phase. And these will react. These will react to form iron 2-sulfate. It's in the aqueous phase. plus copper, solid, copper solid. This is actually one of the tests that you would do if you were here in, in, uh, in the lab, but uh, I'm not doing this test. I think there are other ones that are, that are better able to be seen uh, with my video recording. This one would not be. All right, so this reaction actually occurs. Okay, first thing, what type of reaction would this be? Well, if you read your, your handout over here and you look at the patterns, you should see that this is, well, iron would be an A plus B, C, right? Copper would be B, sulfate would be C, and it forms an AC plus a B. Okay. So this would be a single replacement reaction. And there would be observations that you would make in the experiment that would actually, there would be clues to tell you that copper is being formed. Right? Copper is being formed. There would be clues for that. And there would be clues to tell you that this iron over here is being consumed. And so knowing what your starting materials are, you would have this. Seeing the observations that are taking place, and then understanding about the different reaction types, you would come to the conclusion that this is probably a 
single displacement reaction, and based on that, you would give me the products over here. Okay, so back to this equation. What I've written up here is called a molecular equation. This is a molecular equation. Molecular equation. Okay. This is a molecular equation. We can write this in another way, this is a chemical equation, that we call a total ionic equation. Total ionic equation. Now, don't be fooled. Just because it says total ionic equation, that doesn't mean that only ions are present in the equation. The total ionic equation for this reaction would be the iron solid. And now this, I have to separate into their ions. I have to write it in this form. Okay? I have to write it in this form. So that would be copper, solid, and that's 2 plus. That's why your nomenclature comes in handy. Plus sulfate, not copper solid, that's copper aqueous. Sorry, I'm sure a lot of you right now, especially students that, that pay attention to these videos, really get at it, are probably going, what the hell, what are you talking about? I suppose it's supposed to be aqueous. You're right, it's aqueous. It's aqueous phase. Aqueous. AQ. Right? And copper's in the aqueous phase up here. Cu2 plus aqueous. And the sulfate is also in the aqueous phase. Okay. We're just rewriting this situation into the separation, the separated form. Over here on the product side, okay, we have iron 2, ion, it's in the aqueous phase. Okay. Plus sulfate. aqueous phase and then we have copper solid so this would be the total ionic equation total ionic equation shows all ions it doesn't mean only ions are in the equation but it shows all ions as being separate okay where they are actually separate okay so this is a total ionic equation there's one more equation. It's called a net ionic equation. Net ionic equation. The net ionic equation is similar to the total ionic equation, except we eliminate ions that can be found, both in type and number, on both the reactant and product side. Right? We eliminate those. So you go through your total ionic equation and you identify the ions that can be seen on both sides of the equation. So I saw an ion, copper 2 plus. Do we have copper 2 plus over here? No, we do not. Do not. We have copper solid, but we do not have copper 2 plus. Sulfate 2 minus aqueous. Do we have a sulfur 2 minus aqueous? Yes, we do. It's right there. So we can eliminate those. Those are called spectator ions spectator ions. They're watching the reaction. You notice they're not really involved in the reaction at all. They're sitting there watching, watching iron and copper do their thing. Right. And once you, if you're correct, once you're going on the reactant side, the product side should be correct. But I think it's a good idea just to double check the product side. So iron 2 plus, do we have an iron 2 plus aqueous over here? No, we have an iron solid, but it's not iron 2 plus aqueous. And we have a copper solid. Do we have a copper solid over here? No, we have a copper 2 plus aqueous. All right, so we're good. We've eliminated all of our spectator ions. And so the total, the net ionic equation down here would be the total ionic equation minus the sulfates.
So that's the net ionic equation. Okay. Let's um about, let's see, sodium chloride dissolved in water, so it's in the aqueous phase, reacts with silver nitrate. It also happens to be in the aqueous phase. And the products over here would be silver chloride, it precipitates out as a solid. Okay. Silver chloride would come out as a solid. And sodium nitrate would be remaining in the aqueous phase. Sodium nitrate would be in the aqueous phase. This is actually a precipitation reaction. It's also a double displacement reaction, if you can see that. So we can write this as this is the molecular equation. So you probably should pause the video now and see if you can write this as a total ionic equation and then a net ionic equation. And that's what I'm about to do, but I, I really suggest you pause and see if you can write one out. Okay, I have to write a little bit smaller. Actually, I'm going to turn it like this. Okay. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. I might be confusing. I have to write a little bit smaller to be able to get all this on this page. I'm going to do it down here. So we have to rewrite this in its separated form. We're talking about a total ionic equation. So this means that sodium chloride is dissolved in water. They're separated. So we have sodium, 2 plus, AQ, plus chloride, it's not 2 plus, not 2 plus. Chloride AQ. So this and this the same way. This is just represented it differently. We represent it this way when we're talking about ionic equations. Same thing with the silver nitrate up here. This is where your nomenclature comes in handy. I mean, you should know what the, the charge is on all these. If you see this, you should know how to separate it into its component ions and be able to give its proper charge. Right? You have to show its charge on these net ionic equations. Okay, apologize for that. Camera froze up for some reason. At least it did on my monitor. I couldn't see any movement. All right, so here's where we are. So we've written these, and there are two ionic, separated ionic forms. Now we have to draw the products. Okay. 
this, all right, the solid is precipitated. These two ions have come in, come together, and they precipitated out of the solution. So if you did this reaction, these would be two clear transparent liquids. You mix them together, and you would get this cloudy precipitate that would form, and that would be the silver chloride precipitating out. That means these two ions have come together, right? They're no longer separated, solid, or in the solid form. So we'd write this just like we do up here. These ions are not separated. Sodium nitrate, on the other hand, is. So this is the total ionic equation. Let's do the net ionic equation. Do we have a sodium plus over on the reactant product side? Yes, we do. So we get rid of these. We have a chloride minus AQ on the reactant side. Product side. Nope. Silver plus AQ on the product side. Nope. Nitrate AQ minus nitrate minus AQ. Do we see it on the product side? Yes. So we can eliminate that one. Now all we do is write the net ionic equation with the remaining ions that we haven't crossed out up here. So the spectators are the sodium and the nitrate. So that's basically it. Now in your notebook. Back up to your front. So again, you're going to do a test. You're going to make some observations from the test. But in your notebook, you're going to write the test number. You're going to write the complete chemical equation. The equation I want up here should be the molecular equation. Right? The molecular equation like this and then the reaction type and your observations and reasons that allow you to make these two determinations okay now that'll be the main part of your notebook there will be three reactions though three of the reactions that you record in your notebook that I'm going to ask you to write total and net ionic equations for and that'll be after Right after all of this, after all this, you put that at the end of your notebook. Three of the reactions that you do, and you determine up here, right, you have to write total and net ionic equations for those reactions. Don't put it in the main body, all right? Those three questions should be at the end, the very back of your notebook. Okay, that's all I have for right now.